All right, we are in Proverbs today. Proverbs is this amazing collection of wisdom. In fact, sometimes wisdom personified. And uh, not just God's instruction, um, not, not just full of um, truths, but some things we could call conventional wisdom, where a proverb, a proverb might be, uh, if you work hard, uh, you will prosper. If you are a sluggard, you'll die. Uh, but it's not all, that's not always true, right? Sometimes lazy people somehow do very well in life, and sometimes people who work really hard die early and don't get to, or, or never kind of make it, never succeed. So what we see here is principles from God for our flourishing, but also we see uh, not just principles, but even commands from God, or uh, we see in these Proverbs elements of God's character, elements of his goodness, elements of his plan for how he wants to relate with his people, how he wants us to relate to one another, and how he wants his people to relate to the world around us, even the environment around us. In today's passage, we're looking at three verses. What I hope uh, to, to help you understand today is uh, even though if you read through Proverbs from like Proverbs 1.1 1, 1, right through to the end, 31, uh, you might go, man, this seems like just kind of, they've just got a couple of thousand Proverbs and just kind of stuck them all together uh, in no particular order. Um, but as we're reading through Proverbs 21 today, we're only going to read three verses, but your homework is to read the rest of Proverbs 31, uh, 21, I should say. What you'll see is uh, they're not just kind of little dis- discrete atomistic shoehorn together um, verses or proverbs, but God is actually helping us and they're put together in such a way that he's, he's building upon uh, verse by verse to help us understand how God wants us to relate to him, to one another, and to people around us. So let me read these first three verses. This is Proverbs 21, verse 1 to 3. It says this, A king's heart is like streams of water in the Lord's hand. He directs it wherever he chooses. All a person's ways seem right to him, but the Lord weighs hearts. Doing what is righteous and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Depending on your version, you may recognize some of these words. Uh, Let's pray and see what God would have for us today. Father, I want to thank you again for your scriptures, for these words. We don't want to just treat it as knowledge We want to grow in and, um, I guess, be puffed up by knowledge, but we want to know more of you, more of your character, more of your heart, more of your plan for the world and for us. And so help us to be formed by your scriptures. Help us to be open, have open hearts and minds to your Holy Spirit, that you would be ministering among us today by your scriptures, by your spirit. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. And so right from the beginning, these might seem like, oh, they kind of go together. Let me show you how they go together. Let me show you why these are very important words, but also how they kind of go together. And then when you go and read the rest of Proverbs 21, you'll see, oh, it's kind of like uh, variations on the theme coming back to the same thing over and over again with kind of random, seemingly random things, you know, interspersed between. Uh, But the author uh, of these Proverbs and the p- people who collated it together and certainly the Holy Spirit who brought it all together is helping to show us and build upon his argument. And what is that argument? The author is showing us that God is sovereign even over the most powerful, most free of all humans. Right in the very beginning, <clears throat> a king's heart. So we're talking about a king, not just a even even a very powerful warrior, or not even a general, but a king, the one who says something, and that is the law of the land. God is sovereign over even the most powerful and free among humans. The beginning of wisdom, Proverbs tells us elsewhere, is understanding that God is in charge. And why this is amazing for us is to know that you aren't in charge, and I'm not in charge. It helps us. It actually takes a massive load off us to understand God is sovereign over everything. Even in the author's day, the king or kings would have been the most powerful of people. Again, they say something, that is the thing that happened. Are we going to go to war today? 
The king says so, yes we are. Uh, are we going to build something over there? The king says so, yes we are. Uh, absolute deference to this human being. And wisdom tells us, actually God is in charge and control over even the most sovereign of humans. It gives us confidence. We don't have to place our confidence in the powerful. We don't have to place our confidence in the charismatic. We don't have to place our confidence in the intelligent, the good-looking, the impressive. And we don't have to place our confidence in ourselves. Do you know how, again, how liberating it is to not have to be in control of my own life because God is? Confidence in rulers, institutions, and experts, you may be aware of this, is at an all-time low. Even if we just look at those three categories of rulers or governors or politicians, uh, trust in those kinds of people, all-time low. Trust in institutions at an all-time low and well-deserving as well. Even Christian institutions, um, people who represent those institutions have done a horrific job of representing Jesus uh, over the last 50 or 70 years. Experts, experts are having a very difficult time. Even just this week, um, out of the medical field, experts, long-held, fundamentally accepted truths from the field of medicine have been upended. People are going, oh my goodness, who can we trust? This has nothing to do with COVID, mind you. Uh, uh, Alzheimer's research, understood to be unquestioned. Someone questioned it and discovered, oh, actually, there might have been some fraudulent... Uh, reporting going on back in the day. Our understanding of depression and chemical imbalance in the brain. Uh, again, foundationally understood, accepted as, as truth. Absol not absolute, general consensus uh, in the last week. Oh, actually, maybe some of those things are fraudulent and maybe none of that is true. Like shock waves reverberating around the globe in the medical field this week. Who's trusting experts? This is on the back of pretty low trust in experts uh, over the global pandemic. How can we possibly trust people, let alone organise as a small community, let alone organise like a global response to a pandemic? How are we possibly supposed to do that <clears throat> with trust being at an all-time low? We're continually let, continually let down by rulers, uh, see corruption in institutions, misaligned incentives from experts... Uh, but this proverb helps us understand. We don't need to go bouncing between experts to put a hope in the latest research. We have to go find a politician who we can put all our hopes in and, oh, they, she lets us down, we'll go to the next one. Oh, he lets me down, I'll go to the next one. Oh, over and over and over again. We don't have to go do this trying to find an anchor for our hope, trying to find someone who's in control. Where are all the grown-ups? This is one of the things that shocked me when I became a grown-up just looking around and going, there are no grown-ups. Who's in charge over here? And the more, like now, like friends and peers of mine are the ones who are experts or rulers or uh, governors or heading up massive institutions. And I'm going, they let you in charge. How? We don't need to do that. We have a God who, we looked at a couple of weeks ago, who breathes and billions of stars and galaxies uh, come, into obedience in a, come into existence in obedience to his voice. And so we can look at that. I spoke to a mate of mine this week, called me and said, <clears throat> hey Don, have you seen the James Webb uh, photos? I said, yeah, aren't they amazing? He goes, yeah. They've actually really messed me up. Uh, I see this kind of, the grandness of the expanse of one dot in the night sky and realize how absolutely insignificant I am. This is my paraphrase of my mate. How absolutely insignificant I am. How is God supposed to consider me when he is the being who breathes? And not just that, which is in itself, this tiny speck, unbelievable but then a 360-degree, ever-expanding uh, representation of, of the rest. And I said, yeah, isn't it amazing? And for him, he's like, my mind is just melting, uh, thinking about these things. This is the God who we put our trust in. 
This is a God who, when, when the uh, author here says um, that uh, a king's heart is like streams of water in the Lord's hand, he directs it wherever he chooses, we tend to forget about how amazing and how magnificent, how otherly God is. We view him as like a, a very powerful Marvel superhero, kind of at that level of, uh, of volition. But when we, again, consider the expanse, just again, the expanse of the universe, or consider that uh, being sovereign over all of the world's sovereigns, the, the, the men in our day, men and women who might cause people to f- shake in fear, they are nothing, no challenge to God's sovereignty. Like the water goes wherever it wants to go, cuts through dirt, cuts through rock, cuts through everything going where it wants to go. Uh, that's like... God's sovereignty over even the most powerful, most free human. We understand God is God, and these streams of water or the way of life giving blessing comes from following God's ways, being directed by God. This is very countercultural. Our culture says, no, no, you know what's best for you. In fact, people can't even question you because they don't even know what it's like to be you. How dare they? try to speak into your life, let alone some ancient book. How can we let... Siri. How can we let some ancient book, or even a a deity, try to dictate to you? How can we let some other person try to say to you, this is how you should live? Nobody knows you like you. You are your ultimate authority. Even saying, no, we defer to God... With, with our renewed understanding of how magnificent he is, uh, it's very, very countercultural. That's why I think uh, this next verse comes in right afterwards. Next verse is, all a person's ways seem right to him. Our way seems right to us. This is why these are right next to each other. God is in control of, I mean, air, n- there's nothing outside of his purview. Nothing is difficult for him. Everything is either allowed or sent by him. But our, our way seems right to us. This is the maximum of our day. You do you, and I'll do me. Because you know you, and I know me, and we won't let anybody tell us otherwise. And that works great until your way comes into conflict with my way. Then all of a sudden we have a problem. Because you do you and I'll do me and everybody does everybody actually doesn't really work. But surely I know what's right for me, which is why we get frustrated when people let us down. It's why we get frustrated when people disagree with us. We looked at this just a couple of weeks ago about uh, disagreeing. We can't do it anymore because I operate according to my understanding and my way obviously is the correct perspective because it is a lived and embodied experience. How can you question my experience? It's my experience. It's, it's the reality of, of the way the world works, my way. And then you go, but wait a second, you're always different to my way, and my way is also an embodied lived experience. My way is the right way, and, and what Scripture is trying to tell us is our way seems right to us. That's why we see people as barriers to progress or success or barriers to our preferred vision of the future because how can they disagree with me if they were wise like me? then they would understand. Or maybe they just lack some knowledge. Or if I don't understand, I'm, I, there's just some knowledge out there I can go and get, and then I'll have the correct perspective because my way seems right to me. Subjectively better. And if we do have this disagreement, I can go and get my own experts, my own popular commentators, my own super smart-sounding, attractive, well-spoken YouTubers or TikTokers to back up my perspective. I can get my tribe on board and to overwhelm you or your tribe with an obviously, objectively superior understanding because my way is right to me. I can even get theologians who, who agree with me. Let's find some. We're partial to our own self-interest. We're partial to our own understanding. We're partial to our own tribe of people who agree with us and we are absolutely in favour of not changing. <clears throat> because our way is right. 
we have the right understanding. But God is impartial. What the scripture tells us is he sees perfectly. He doesn't, he doesn't even see um, things from just a perspective. He sees right through all perspectives to the reality of things. The scripture tells us here, he weighs hearts. He doesn't just see them, but because he is sovereign, because he is Lord, he actually he weighs the hearts. He says, not, not just what is your action, but what is the state of your heart? Not what seems good to you, but how is your heart before a holy and righteous and powerful God? God doesn't just look at our actions on our best day, doesn't just look at our actions on our worst day. He weighs our hearts every day at all times. Because what he wants is your heart. What he wants is my heart. But that I don't mean like, you know, the organ here that pumps blood. I mean the, the center, the seat, the sum, the weight of your being, of who you are. God made you for relationship with him. He wants you. And it's not a scary thing. It's a wondrous thing. That again, the God who whispers and galaxies appear, in, in comparison to whom we are vaporous, he's eternal, we are gone in a moment. He is like beyond compare, uh, majestic, and we are tiny and squishy and you know, flesh and bone. And yet he stoops down to even becoming a part of his own creation in order to have a relationship with us. He, he, his love is wonderful. And when he's talking about, you know, our way seems good to us, when it comes to how we relate with him, he doesn't want us to have some sort of box-checking relationship with him. He doesn't like rote worship, dispassionate lip service, uh, he doesn't even want costly sacrifice. You know, the one big show, uh, the, the hour and 15 minutes on a Sunday, I'll come and I'll lift my hands, hands high, heart abandoned, uh, and then Sunday night through to Sunday afternoon the next week, I just go and I'm, I'm Lord of my own life and don't give God another consideration. Um, like, the, like the husband who neglects, his wife or family uh, always off with uh, hobbies or stuck on computer games or whatever it is and then thinks, well, I'll buy my wife flowers and chocolates and that will score me enough brownie points to last me through the next month of neglect. Like just do the one big, the one big show. Will we treat God like this? The person who does lots for God. I'm just, I'm going to, do all of these things for God, and then when God doesn't do the thing that you want, we get angry at God. God, I have stacked up these accomplishments for you. Where's you coming through for me on the things that I want? Or again, we get into this box checking of, well, God wants me to tithe, and he wants me to uh, be a part of a church community, and so, uh, you know, tick the tithe box, tick the um, connect, you know, coming on a Sunday box, uh, tick the sponsoring a kid box or whatever, and then you're like, well, I did it. Checked all my boxes. We treat God, instead of uh, considering God's favor as his like unmerited favor, like he has favor for us, grace for us, affection for us, because of his own will towards us, we treat him like, well, we'll do a favor for you, and now you owe me a favor. It's a completely different kind of favor. That's not how God wants us to relate with him. He said he wants us to be like him, to love like him, and to love him. How do we know this? The very next verse. That's why the next proverb comes in, doing what is righteous and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. So it starts with the king's heart is like streams of water in the Lord's hand. He directs it wherever he chooses. God is magnificent and mighty above all things, all of a person's ways seem right to him. So I, you know, my way seems right to me. But God weighs hearts 
And doing what is righteous and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Why do we need this in here? This theme of God being more about your life of justice and righteousness, much more than your grandiose acts of worship, runs throughout Scripture. It's, it is, it's all over it. Uh, we can go to like uh, 1 Samuel 15. Saul, King Saul, the very first king of the Israelites. Uh, God didn't really want him to have a king. He just wanted to be their king. They said, no, give us a king, give us a king. He's like, fine, have Saul. Towered above men, impressive human being. Well, it looked like an impressive human being. God comes to him and says, here's my judgment, here's my justice. My judgment on this matter is, I want you to go and completely destroy the Amalekites. This is what righteousness looks like. Do what I've commanded. And, and Saul goes, okay, so here's God's justice. Here's God's righteousness. But I'm just going to negotiate around the edges because that doesn't seem right to me, God. I'm going to do it my way. And I'm going to save all of the good bits and then sacrifice them to you so that you can see how much I love you. And then he goes and does that. And Samuel the prophet comes to him and says, what are you doing, Saul? So I was like, I did this amazing thing for God. Look at this. Look what I did. So he goes, you know what God wants from you. He wants justice and righteousness. You've picked your own path. You've done your own thing. You haven't listened to God at all. He wasn't trying to um, align with God's heart. He was trying to do things his own way. And Saul comes to him and say, um, Samuel comes to him and says, does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as in obeying the Lord? Look, to obey is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. We don't get to manufacture our own self-styled sense of justice and righteousness and bound this up and present it to God and say, uh, see how much I've done for you, God, when he has already said, this is what I require from you. This is how I have built you for your own joy and for the good of those around you and for my glory. And we say, nah, let me, let me show you what your glory looks like. Let me show you what I know my joy can be found in. Let me show you how I'm going to work for the good of those around me. It seems, seems foolish, again, when we consider the very first line of the Proverbs for today. It's echoed again in Hosea, Hosea 6. What am I going to do with you, Ephraim? What am I going to do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist and like the early dew that vanishes. So, I, yeah, I love you, Lord, and whew, it's gone. This is why I have used the prophets to cut them down. I've killed them with my words from my mouth. My judgment strikes like lightning, for I desire faithful love and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Echoed again in Isaiah, another prophet. What are your sacrifices to me, asked the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of well-fed cattle. I've no desire for the blood of bulls and lambs and male goats. A little later, stop bringing useless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. A little later, when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will refuse to look at you. Even if you offer countless prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves. Cleanse yourselves. Remove your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do what is good. Pursue justice. Correct the oppressor. Defend the rights of the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Again and again and again, God's people forget what God has, has told them. And they come to God and say, Hear God, accept my prayer. Accept my praise. Accept my worship. See how much I'm doing for you. See how much I'm sacrificing for you. And he says, I hate it. You're box checking. He's trying to get my attention. He's saying, you already have my attention. You already have my love. You already have my favor. Stop trying to earn these things. Or alternately, they don't care about him at all. Let us know that he is God and he is magnificent and he is a deity to be placated with sacrifices. And that's not the kind of God we have. It's not the kind of relationship he wants. He says, I hate that stuff. So I've shown you my heart. Go and do justice. Echoed by Micah. 
Uh, what should I bring before the Lord when I come bow down before God on high? Should I come before him with burnt offerings, with year old calves? Would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with 10,000 streams of oil? Should I give my firstborn for my transgression, the offspring of my body for my own sin? People, he's told you what each, he's told each of you what is good and what is the Lord, what it is the Lord requires of you to act justly, love, faithfulness, and walk humbly with your God. Do you hear the echoes over and over and over again? All of these prophets, prophets were the ones who came to the people of God and said, Oh guys, you got it wrong again. You got it wrong again. You got it wrong again. And so many times, they don't like the prophets. They treat them horrifically. They bash them. They kill them. They reject them. They say, no, my way is the way. You don't, you don't know what it's like to be me. You don't, you don't understand my perspective of the world. My way is right. Forgetting about the, the majesty of God, his absolute sovereignty, our vaporous squishiness um, and his unmerited favor and love towards us. Over and over and over again. It's echoed by Jesus. Mark 12. It says, To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is far more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Again, Jesus, Matthew 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You pay a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin, and yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. These things should have been done without neglecting the others. So Jesus says, you know what? You're doing these things as a box-checking exercise. Think, if I just do these things, God has to love me. In fact, I'm going to do these favors for God, then God has to do the things that I want him to do or the things that he's promised me. And it's this transactional relationship that the uh, Pharisees and the, and the scribes had with their God. And Jesus says, you guys are hypocrites. That's, that's not what God requires of you. That's not what God wants from you. God doesn't want you to do these things as a box-checking exercise. Jesus says, you should, you should do these things, but without neglecting the more weighty measures of the law, like faithfulness and love, and justice, and mercy. So it's not an either or. It's not a where you do the grandiose things, the big sacrifices, that God has to love you. Fast for 10 days, 40 days, uh, and then you're going to twist God's arm because you have massive, grandiose show of love, which is just, again, like the neglectful boyfriend or husband. Say, what do you? These things should have been done without neglecting the others. Doing what is just and doing what is righteous or pursuing righteousness. These things are important to God. God's saying, uh, don't, don't forget about sacrifice, but the sacrifice is not the thing you do to get God's love. It's not the thing you do to get God's attention. He's saying, what gets God, God's attention is when you see and know his heart and then you have the same heart and then you go and live out of these new loves. This is what scripture is resounding, echoing over and over and over and over again. There's, there's this uh, godly ethic or way of life and there's godly justice and we're to pursue both. Not as, a, not as a box checking exercise again, but because you have the love and the favor of God. Because He, although He shouldn't, for, from my worldly understanding, I look at the perfection and the wonder of God and I go, I echo King David and I say, You should not look at me. Who, who am I that you would think about me? Even just from what I can see, let alone. What we can see now, you know, with these new te technological advancements about the majesty of space, and that's just the creation of the creator who is much, much, much more magnificent than that. But he considers you, he loves you, 
He's done everything necessary to remove every barrier of sin, of every element of guilt, of all of your shame, every stain of sin. He's dealt with all of that on the cross of Christ so that you might know and experience his love. And it's become more like him, that we can go and live more as him in the world. This is why you talk about King David. He's a guy who, he did not treat his relationship with God like a box checking exercise. He didn't check the boxes. In fact, sometimes he did really poorly on the box checking. Uh, When he walked into the temple and he ate the food of the presence, which he was not allowed to do. And yet scripture says he he was a man after God's own heart. And then he goes and treats Uriah really, and Bathsheba really horrifically, not checking the boxes. And yet still, uh, the scripture says of him, he is a man after God's own heart. What it means is, uh, as you live in the liberty and the freedom you have in the love of God, <clears throat> we still aren't trying to check boxes. We're still living in the freedom of knowing him and, and running hard after his heart and after the things that he loves. And when we fail, his love for you doesn't change. When you do awesome, his love for you doesn't change because he already loves you the most. There's no more he can love you. He's already forgiven you the most. There's no more he can forgive you. There's no barrier, no separation, nothing in between you and his love. Again, it's the most wonderful and liberating way to live. This, at once, at the same time, helps us want to obey the will of God and frees us from worrying about whether or not we've tithed out of our spice rack. So, again, Jesus says, you know, do this without neglecting that. But when we do fail, we do slip up, or when we falter, uh, we still have the greatest of confidence that nothing is separating not not our present sin. This might be one of those lies that you've been told from uh, well-meaning and ill-informed preachers uh, that when you sin, like presently, or it might be a hangover from Catholicism, uh, that there's this barrier between you and God. When in actual fact, Jesus has dealt with all of your sin for all time. It's done, it's dealt for. When you're united with Christ, you are united with Christ. Trying to live, like trying harder to live better, it's not going to make God more impressed with you about how you're, you know, checking your boxes as if you're trying to like reach up to him. He's, he's already impressed with you because when he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. When he considers you, he considers the perfection of Jesus the blameless one, the holy one, the beautiful one of heaven. When we think about how does God view us, we think about how does God view his perfect son, Jesus, that is how God views you. This is hard to, for us to receive because we know our sinful hearts, our sinful proclivities, even our present sinful struggles, but God doesn't see us that way. On our account, he has removed our sin as far as the east is from the west. It also means you can come here today, sing your guts out, you know, lift up your hands and, and, and look like the most amazing Christian. And yet tomorrow, go trample on the poor, neglect justice, cheat your customers, cheat your boss, your employer. Uh, and what good is your singing when your heart is against God? God sees straight through your behavior to your heart. We we want a a good and a clean and a a new heart to lead to righteous living, but trying to manufacture an appearance of good living does not change your heart. So what we want to do is walk in righteousness, act justly, humbly follow after God, rather than then going and living under our own lordship, under our own best understanding, negotiating with the commands of the sovereign king of heaven, uh, and then come and 
give him our offering, which is just a clinging going to him. It doesn't have to be. This week in our discipleship groups, this week for you, my hope is, uh, we'll do some of the work of um, considering our own lives, considering how are we relating with God? Are we relating with him in a box-checking exercise? Are we, are we being hypocrites like the Pharisees who think we can work our way up to God somehow? Or are we living in the liberating light of the gospel and the love of God and, and letting the love of God do the sanctifying work in us to now that he's given us a new heart to live in light of and out of the new love that God has given us that will result in righteousness and, and pursuit of justice. And we'll do this not just, you know, as Christian Rambos off by ourselves, uh, but in community and encouraging one another along the way. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you that his finished work on the cross is all that is necessary for us to have um, renewed relationship with you. That we are seen as righteous. We're seen as holy and blameless because of Jesus, not because we're awesome. But help us, Lord. We don't want to just give you lip service. Uh, We don't want to uh, claim the benefits of your love without your love having its full effect in our lives, that we would love like you, would love others like you, would love you, how you'd have us love you. Lord, please help us. Help us to have hearts after your own heart. Father, every way, um, we're we're keen to encourage one another along uh, this way, and so... Um, Like you, don't judge by outward appearances, but weigh the heart. Uh, Would you help us also to um, not be impressed or dazzled by external appearances? Father, help us to check uh, when we start to think that our ways are better than your ways. Just remind us again of your magnificence, your gloriousness. And even our, again, our our squishiness, uh, but also how loved we are by you. You're such a great and wonderful God. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.